Well, good morning. Will you stand with us today? We're going to start a new song or learn a new song. So I uh, hope you guys like it. <laughs> My name is Emma Ann. I want to welcome you to Dallas Church this morning. If you are new with us, go see David at the Connection booth. He has a gift that he'd like to give you from us. And then if you're new online, drop a message into that chat feature so that we can connect with you. Today we're starting a new series called Friending, which we're really excited about. So glad you're here. Let's say a prayer as we begin our service this morning. Lord, I pray that you would help us to focus our minds and our hearts on what you have to say today, Lord. I pray that we would be able to take just a nice deep breath as we sit here and kind of recharge for our week. In your name we pray, amen. With all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. 
I remember when I was a kid that a lot of my friends would do silly things. I know that's a shocking thing for you to hear from me this morning. One of the things we used to do, which always surprises people, I think, but we used to make silly videos with old technology called a Super 8. Anybody ever heard heard of a Super 8? They were like the old, old video cameras, and they were actually pretty versatile. You, you, could, you could create videos, you could, you could uh, actually do a pretty good job if you had like a, 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 these things I used to call video cassette recorders. You know, w- using some technology back in the day, you could actually do a pretty kind of funny little movie. We used to make those all the time. They weren't always appropriate, but we used to, we used to do that together. And, uh, and I think about some of those friendships back in the day. My best friend growing up, most of my, my childhood years was a, a kid named Billy. And he had a, a, a dairy. His parents owned a dairy. And my parents, we had a big grass seed farm. And the trouble that we would get into, I mean, there are things that we did that I'm not really sure how we're still living from the, the stuff that we did. I mean, you just didn't think about it back in the day. And, and maybe some of you have experiences like that where you had some friends. And, and we all know that friends can sometimes push you to the good stuff. And friends can also kind of push you toward maybe the not so good stuff. And so if you think about your mind and you've grown up and the different friends that you have, who are those friends that pushed you to do well? Uh, you know, it's, it's funny how I actually still have some of those friendships today. In fact, my buddy Billy, he's actually a, a lead pastor. He does, does what I do in, uh, in Southern Oregon. You never know what God can do with a bunch of silly country bumpkins like us. You may have friendships like that. I mean, we all have those stories. I mean, if you're, if you're thinking right now, can you think of a story, some goofy thing that you and your friends did back in the day that you're kind of glad there wasn't YouTube and Facebook and all that stuff around when you, when you, you, know, you did that, that thing? I'm so glad a lot of what, what we did and the, the trouble we got into wasn't recorded. I can't imagine. I have a lot of compassion for younger generation that nothing is, is everything's just all being recorded all the time. But it's interesting that the people that we spend time with influence us. The, the people that we spend time with, they can kind of shape who we are and what we become. 
Again, for, for, for good, for bad, they, they, these circumstances, as we go through life, the people that we're walking with can, can in some ways make or break us. And, and there's a scripture that we'll, we'll talk about in this series, but, you know, he who walks with the wise will be wise. And there's a sense that who you spend your time with as friendships matter. And, and for us as Christ followers, who you spend time with really can determine your, your, your maturity with Jesus, your walk with the Lord, your, dis, your, your, your role as a disciple. And so those friendships become super powerful. So we're kicking off this series today, and we're going to look at a number of things with regard to friendship. I mean, look, we're, we're coming out of one of the weirdest times that we've all had to deal with. So, social you know, distancing in many ways has turned to emotional distancing. And so we're at a time where I think we need to reawaken the idea of, of, of spending time together, investing in relationships. And, and that could be as simple as, 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 as more meals together or, or having some shared interests or going hiking or fishing, something where we're connecting with people. Coming out of this, we really need to rekindle that because God does great work in relationships. It's why we, we love groups and teams around here, because when you're rubbing shoulders with people, it helps you to grow. And so that's why we're doing this series called Friending. I think it's a crucial time to be talking about that and fostering healthy friendships, not just for the sake of just more friends in your, in your, in your posse, but actually growing and maturing in Christ. So that's what our hope is today. I'm Pastor Ben. I'm glad you're, you're with us, whether it be in person or online. We, we see you. We're glad that you are here. We do this gathering every Sunday because about 2,000 years ago, Jesus of Nazareth lived a perfect life, was born in a miraculous way, lived a perfect life, taught and did many wonderful things, was crucified on a cross, and all thought, everybody thought everything was lost. But then on the third day, on a Sunday, Jesus rose from the dead. That tomb was empty and it's changed human history forever. And so that's why we gather on Sundays. It's a chance to take a deep breath, hit the reset button, we're kicking off a new series today, so if it was a bad week for you, my hope is this is going to be a reset. So let's, uh, let's pause now for a word of prayer as we get going. Father, we thank you for your love and faithfulness. We're thankful that you create us for relationship. Uh, and, and so each of us has this opportunity to grow in faith because of the people that we put around us and the people that you draw into our lives. So Father, help us uh, to be wise about that. Uh, Father, w- whether we're uh, introverted or extroverted or ambiverted, whatever that might be, Father, we know that we're created for relationship and you want to do great work through relationships. So Father, empower us for that. Help us to hear from your word and to be challenged and changed today in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, today we're going to talk about a really key idea, which is empathy. Uh, And so today's message is called Just All the Feels, because there's sometimes in relationship that we need to feel what someone else is feeling. And so we're going to talk about that quite a bit today. But before we do that, let me tell you a story about, about this guy I heard about. This guy, he was a pretty wealthy guy. He had a lot going for him. He had many businesses, and they were all doing really well. He was a wealthy individual. Uh, people w- w- would travel just to see this guy. He was, he was well known in the, in the, in the place that he, he lived. He had houses and had a, a wonderful family, a beautiful family, had wife, and, and she, she loved him. He had, he had great friends. He had, he had ties in agriculture and, and, and ties in, in, in livestock. This guy was doing really, really, really well. And through a, a number of circumstances, things begin to unravel for him. Uh, first, it, it turned out his, 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 his family uh, was decimated by a horrible incident, horrible accident, very heart-wrenching, and then, and then some of his businesses began to be uh, dismantled, taken apart, either by theft or uh, downturns in the economy, whatever it might be. And so this perfect situation started to unravel very quickly. And pretty soon, friends are not interested in hanging out. And, uh, you know, at some point, even his wife says, you know, you ought to, you ought to just curse God and die. Well, that story might start to sound familiar now. The gentleman's name, as you probably already figured out, was Job. And there's a lot we could unpack with the story of Job. If you've ever read Job, there's a lot of questions that I have. And it's always good to have questions when you're reading Scripture. But to go from everything, having everything, 
to have, have anything removed from them. Everything that created security, created identity, all gone. And in that moment, everybody's kind of scattered. Job has a few friends that, that stop by. And these friends, they've heard what's happened, and they show up on the scene, and, 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 and Job is sitting there. He's got sores all over his body. He's destitute financially. He's hurting. And these friends come, and they sit down on the ground with him. And they don't do anything. They just sit there. Not for an hour, not even for a day. It says they were there for better part of a week, seven days. And they, and they sat with him. And they didn't say anything. Now, if you know the rest of the story, yes, after that seven-day period, there's about 30 chapters in the book of Job where there's all kinds of conversation and the friends kind of go sideways and there's all kinds of things going on. Spoiler alert, at the end of Job, there is some bright spot. Some of his businesses get restored. He's got family around him again. And I think his wife, you know, comes back. And I, that was an, I'm sure that was an interesting conversation. So, so some things do get restored. Again, still lots of questions for me at the end of that. So you know that, that things kind of turned out okay eventually, but I think what people miss in this whole story of Job, and this is really going to feed into what we're talking about today, is that they sat with him and shut up. They just sat with him. Now, in what I do a lot of times, it, when I'm at a hospital visit or I'm visiting with the family that I'm about to do a funeral for, I've, I've got one this week. And, uh, and, and there's all kinds of stuff, sure, that I could say. But sometimes people need a ministry of presence. You know, I don't know what your, your week was like. Maybe, maybe that's something that sounds pretty good to you. You don't need someone to you know, rationalize things for you. You don't need a sermon. You don't need someone preaching at you. You need a ministry of presence. Because sometimes things are hard and there's no answer. I know that that doesn't sound real good to say in the church setting, but there are times that it, there's, there's no real quick answer, right? I mean, you've been through this. Even those of us who've been following Jesus for a while, there's moments where there's literally nothing I can say right now. Ministry of presence, seven days. Think about that. When was the last time you were quiet for an hour? For me, five minutes, two minutes. The last time you actually sat with somebody and didn't say anything. Some of you have been through some tremendous losses. And you know what it's like to be in a valley. And you, as well as I know, there's no words that are going to somehow magically take it away. Yes, we follow Jesus, we have faith, but sometimes it's hard. Sometimes we don't hear from God for a long time. Everybody talks about the Moses story. Things are going on all the time. He was in the desert for a long time without hearing from the Lord. Sometimes people need a ministry of presence, to be there, to sit with them, and in some ways, to try at least to feel how they feel. Now, we are going to talk in this series about boundaries, okay? Because there's sometimes where you do need healthy boundaries. Because some of those things can be very, very hard to sit with someone on. So you will need that. We'll talk about that in a week or two. But the ministry of presence, they sat with him for seven days. And what did they not do? And talk. So there, there could be someone. Maybe this is it for you today. You came here today. You weren't sure what's going on. But maybe you have someone in your life. You don't, need to, you don't need to say anything to them. You need to be with them. You know, someone suffering from cancer, someone suffering from the loss of a loved one, someone dealing with suicide of someone they love. These are heavy, heavy things. And sometimes God would call you and I to just be there with them and not say a word. Does that make sense? It's like, it's like leaning in a little bit to feel how they feel. 
And I, I love how Jesus modeled this. There were times where uh, you know, he, 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 would, he would go through his ministry and life, and sometimes he would be with people. Oftentimes, Jesus would ask questions. In fact, that was the main way that Jesus communicated most truth was he would sort of ask the question and draw it out of you. It's like he was more curious about what you have to say than what he has to say. Can you, can you just pause on that for a minute? That God actually cares what you think? He wants to hear from you. Sometimes we're so busy trying to talk and rationalize and all of that. Sometimes quiet is good, leaning into the model of Jesus. In fact, he said, people will know you're my followers because you love one another. And the word that he uses is a Greek word that is pretty heavy. The word he uses is the kind of love that puts someone else's needs above your own. How do we know what somebody needs? got to ask them. you got to listen. There's a ministry of presence required. We actually have to know what someone needs. Because Jesus said in John 13, a new commandment I give you, that you love one another just as I have loved you. You also are to love one another. By this, all people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. See, knowing someone's needs requires that you get to know them, that you understand what's going on in the situation. It takes time. It takes listening. It takes leaning in. Sometimes it takes feeling. Folks, that's empathy. That is empathy. Leaning in. I heard a CEO of a major company, I'm not going to say who it was, give a big press conference, and the big takeaway line from that conference is a tech guy. And he said, what the world needs now is a little more empathy. And I think coming out of this, people need a lot of empathy. This has been one of the hardest times many of us have gone through. And, and there's a lot of people still in isolation. And I think this is our time to be empathetic. I think about that interaction in Luke chapter 8. In Jesus' ministry, things were getting crazy. Uh, people were coming out in droves because they heard he was creating food on the fly and healing people. And things were really, really going well. His disciples are feeling pretty good. They're, they're, they get to kind of hang on his coattails. Things are they're going great. You remember Luke chapter 8, though? They're, they're on their way to go. This really important person, they've got a healing we've got to do. We're on the move. We've got to do something. And someone hears that he's going to be in town. Someone who has been suffering for over a decade with internal bleeding and pain, hemorrhaging. This gal... Was desperate. She spent everything she had, and the doctors couldn't, couldn't do anything. And she hears when that Jesus, this guy that she's just heard bits and pieces about, she heard that he's going to be going through town. And so she desperately tries to crawl through the crowd. You know the story. The disciples are there. They're kind of moving Jesus, almost like they're, they're his bodyguards or something. You know, we got important stuff to do, Jesus. We're heading this way. you got this really important healing we got to do. And no, there's no distractions. And this gal somehow, by a miracle, who knows, she's able to somehow get through the crowd. And she's just thinking, what is she thinking? If I could just touch him. Just, if, I could just, if I could just touch him, then this thing would go away. She didn't even really know Jesus. She just thought, I've heard great things. Maybe, just maybe, if I just touch him. So she does it. And she knows she's healed right away. And it causes Jesus to pause. You remember the story now? Some of you kind of remember this? It, it, he stops what he's doing. They were heading off to do a really important healing. And he stops. And of course, his disciples, what are they saying? What are you doing? What are you doing? This, this gal, I mean, what, what's going on? And G, I don't even know if they see the gal yet. They don't even see the, the lady that was just healed. They're thinking, we got to get here. We got the important stuff to do. And Jesus says, hold on, hold on. Somebody, somebody touched me. And of course, what's their answer? Who hasn't touched you right now, right? You're in this crowd. And he stops. And he said, no, something, something powerful happened. I need, to, I need to stop and feel this because I felt something. What did that feel like? Hold on a minute. 
I mean, I know we're not Jesus, but what did that feel like? To ha- to, to, he knows power went from him. Well, as you know, some of the story, right? The, here's the rest of the story. She introduces herself to Jesus, and, and there's this beautiful moment where he's, you, 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 your faith has made you well. It wasn't because you touched my robe. Your faith has made you well. And, and there's this beautiful moment where Jesus cared enough to stop and feel what she felt. These disciples are still frustrated. In fact, you know the story. Then, then, then whoever they were going, the important person, they get a household messenger and said, I don't bother the teacher anymore. The person already died. And Jesus says, no. Y'all don't know what's going on. But that pause is something that I think we need to lean into sometimes. He felt what she felt. Sometimes that's what love requires of us. One magazine article I wrote, this came out a few years ago. Let me just read part of it. It said, this idea of feeling what someone else feels is the ability to step into the shoes of another person and, and to understand their perspective, to see things the way they see them, and to use that to kind of help guide how we respond. I mean, empathy is different from kindness or pity. In fact, don't con- confuse this with the golden rule. I mean, remember the golden rule? You know, and, and this, Jesus restated it a little differently, but the, the common thought is, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. But I like what George Bernard Shaw said about that. He's like, do, do, do not do unto others as you would have them do unto you, because they might have different needs than you. He's like, how would you know? We have to know the need to know how to respond. In the New Testament, we have the value of empathy seen over and over and over again. From Jesus' words to his ministry, how he operated, Jesus never seemed to be in a hurry when someone had a need. Now, it's true, Jesus didn't, he didn't fix every need. He didn't heal every person, right? We know that. But he never seemed to be in a hurry. When was the last time you were in a hurry? And someone needs you. Someone needs something. How's your reaction? Jesus never seemed to be in a hurry. But he accomplished a pretty good amount of stuff. I mean, you could argue with me, but I think he accomplished some pretty cool stuff. And he never seemed to be in a hurry. And needs never seemed to bother him. Whether it be any of the early church leaders like Peter, Paul, John, they all, they all understand this idea that when you're, when you're loving someone, you need to know what they're going through. And uh, I love this. 1 Peter 3, 8 says, Finally, all of you have unity of mind, sympathy, brotherly love, a tender heart, that's getting into empathy there, and a humble mind. That's, that's from Peter. One of, one of the disciples that hung out with Jesus day in and day out for three years or so. I like what, what Paul wrote in Romans 12, 15. Rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who what? Weep. That means you step in to the picture. You're not some casual observer. You're like, well, that's rough for you, but I'm busy. God would call us to something a little different. John eleven thirty five. 35. You know this. It's two words. Jesus wept. Why did he weep? What, what was he weeping for? You remember what happened? Yeah, his friend Lazarus. He's looking around and people are upset. They're sobbing. He didn't look at that like some distant observer and go, well, that's okay. That's fine. Sad for you guys. He wept. He leaned in and he wept. Now, Lazarus was his friend too. But part of what seems to move him is seeing the hearts of people. And and he he was moved. He felt what they felt. That's important. Listen, if you, if you still are arguing with me on this one, Jesus modeled this. Listen to what Hebrews 4.15 says, For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weakness, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Now, sometimes we get confused between the terms sympathy and empathy. You ever had that problem? You're like, I'm not sure what's what, what's sympathy, what's, what's empathy. It seems kind of confusing. Psychology Today had a little article on this, and it said, you know, 
Empathy is the ability to recognize, understand, and share the thoughts and feelings of another person, sort of experiencing from their point of view, like we've been talking about. Now, sympathy um, is similar, but it's more cognitive. You know, it's like we, we acknowledge it, but we don't have to necessarily feel it. So, so sympathy is, is less emotional investment. It, it sort of keeps a distance between someone's pain and your own. And sometimes that's necessary. But I think too often, at least where we're at right now, sometimes we go the opposite direction where it's all up on our head and we're not, we're not really stepping into someone else's shoes. We're not feeling what they feel. And so we can get too off track with being just more sympathetic from a cognitive perspective and not emotionally invested. And, and I read an article not too long ago in the Wall Street Journal that, as I mentioned before, this pandemic has led many of us to socially distance and then that's turned into emotional distance. And that's something that I think, especially as Christ followers, we can speak to. Here's a, here's a gal, you may have heard of her, uh, Brene Brown. She's written a lot. She's had a couple TED Talks. This, is, I think, is a pretty helpful explanation of the difference between empathy and sympathy. Take a look. So what is empathy and why is it? very different than sympathy. Empathy fuels connection. Sympathy drives disconnection. Empathy, it's very interesting. Teresa Wiseman is a nursing scholar who studied professions, very diverse professions where empathy is relevant and came up with four qualities of empathy. Perspective taking, the ability to take the perspective of another person or, or recognize their perspective as their truth. Staying out of judgment, not easy when you enjoy it as much as most of us do. Recognizing emotion in other people and then communicating that. Empathy is feeling with people. And to me, I always think of empathy as this kind of sacred space when someone's kind of in a deep hole and they shout out from the bottom and they say, I'm stuck, it's dark, I'm overwhelmed. And then we look and we say, hey, and climb down. I know what it's like down here. And you're not alone. Sympathy is... Ooh, it's bad, uh-huh. Uh, no, you want a sandwich? Um, empathy is a choice, and it's a vulnerable choice, because in order to connect with you, I have to connect with something in myself that knows that feeling. Rarely, if ever, does an empathic response begin with at least. I had a, yeah. And we do it all the time because you know what? Someone just shared something with us that's incredibly painful and we're trying to silver lining it. I don't think that's a verb, but I'm using it as one. We're trying to put the silver lining around it. So I had a miscarriage. Oh, at least you know you can get pregnant. I think my marriage is falling apart. At least you have a marriage. <laughs> John's getting kicked out of school. At least Sarah is an A student. But one of the things we do sometimes in the face of very difficult conversations is we try to make things better. If I share something with you that's very difficult, I'd rather you say, I don't even know what to say right now. I'm just so glad you told me. Because the truth is, rarely can a response make something better. What makes something better is connection. Does that make sense? Sometimes we lean in to feel what someone feels. And, and, and instead of just acknowledging it from a cognitive level and saying, oh, that's rough, we would step in and say, I don't know what to say. You know, because sometimes someone goes through something that you don't have any experience on. And so the danger with that sometimes is we just, we don't even lean in at all. But you don't have to have gone through something exactly like someone that's suffering to, to at least lean in with them and to say, I, I've never been through that, but man, I, I'm here. The ministry of presence, and it requires us to feel what they feel. That's, that's empathy. You want a healthy friendship? You want healthy friendships, and even friendships that can help you grow as a disciple? Learning healthy ways to be empathetic can really, really make a difference. And that's even true in business. That's true in leadership. That's true in management. 
if you can actually feel what someone feels, you can actually see the world kind of how they are, it might help with a lot of conflict because you can lean in and say, okay, now, I, I, I don't know all that, but I can see where you, I, could, I could feel that a little bit. And that helps us to, to really love like Jesus asked us to love. Berkeley University came out with this uh, kind of a pro tip, if you will, of how to develop more empathy. And I think these are really, really helpful. And these are some that have helped me quite a bit. And these, these are, aren't, aren't the entire list, but these are the ones I think might be most helpful. When you're wanting to develop more empathy in friendships, especially this time in the world, we can use a little more empathy. It can almost be like a superpower for us. Here, here's a, a few things I thought were helpful. The first one is be curious. You don't always know what someone's going through. Be curious. I mean, take the, the, the posture that Jesus often did, which is asking questions. Because you know what? He actually cares what your answers are. He wants to know. Remember how many times Jesus asked people when they were clearly disabled or they were clearly hurting, Jesus would ask them a very odd question. What do you want? Right? Because if they were lame from birth, do they want to be healed? Because if they get healed, then that means... Well, now I can walk and I can work and I can return to my family and I can go back to, you see, do you want to be healed? Jesus asked questions. So he was curious. I think it's a great idea to stay curious with people around you. What's really people's story? Here's the second one. Challenge the prejudices. So oftentimes we kind of judge people before we even know them. And what if we could learn their story? You know, everybody has got a story. So not only can we be curious, but, but challenge our own prejudices. Maybe we've, we've kind of gotten a certain way of thinking about you know, different people that really isn't helpful. That we've kind of put people in boxes or painted with broad strokes over people that maybe we ought not to do. So challenge those prejudices. You know, discover some, some common ground with someone. That's a, that's a helpful thing. Here's the third thing. Try on someone else's life. What would it be like to walk in your shoes? What would it be like to, to, to have the family you have, to, to have uh, the, 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 the circumstances of how you grew up? What would it be like to uh, be them? Trying on someone else's shoes. What would it be like to walk in their shoes? And here's a fourth one. This may be the best one of the bunch. I don't know. But it's listen hard. Listen. That means we use this muscle a lot less, and we use these muscles a lot more. We listen to what people have to say. That helps us love one another, put someone else's needs above our own, because now we've heard their needs, whereas before we're just talking and we can't hear their needs. So listen, listen hard. And, and then, you know, with it, I think we can be vulnerable that way. If we're listening and not always having to talk or posture or come up with the next great line in a conversation, maybe we just let it hold for a while. We don't always have to fill the space. And here's the last, last one. I think this is good, too. Help other people value empathy. Like, you may have family members or friends or even neighbors that are just kind of harsh, I don't know if you've ever dealt with someone who's just, just really harsh. I mean, they're, 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 they don't want to listen to anything. Maybe they're super stubborn or they just come across really abrasive. Maybe you can be that person to help them see the value of empathy. That, that maybe they could kind of s slow down a little bit and, and value what it means to feel like what someone else feels like. Helping other people do that. So be curious. Challenge prejudices. Walk in someone else's shoes. Listen hard and help other people with that empathy. When we get that hug from a friend or we have someone close to us just sit with us while we grieve, when we get that phone call without an agenda, just checking in, these are hints and signposts of empathy, of someone loving you where you're at, and you can not only experience that, but give that to someone else, especially where we're at right now. So I want, I want us to all embrace the challenge here today of, of, of embracing a little more empathy in our lives, feeling what someone else feels, so that we can obey Jesus' command to love one another and put their needs above your own. Because now we can hear their needs because we're quiet and we're listening and we're, 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 we're aiming for a ministry of presence sometimes. 
We're curious about someone because here's the, the, the big point today, and that is this. Empathy fuels friendship. Empathy fuels friendship. I just had someone reach out to me this morning, early this morning, and thank me for being someone who loves them without judging them. We need those people in our lives, people that are empathetic, that are humble, that f- can feel what we feel sometimes without, without judgment. So I want to pray here in a minute, but maybe you've been hearing some things here today and you're like, I'm really challenged on this. I, I'd encourage you to, to, to really pray this week about how your empathy level is. Uh, you know, God, am I kind of treating everybody as a project or am I actually like leaning in and feeling what they feel? Am, am I being more empathetic? Help me to love like you love, Lord. There's times where I pray this prayer, and, I, and I'll, I'll say it out loud, and I want to pray it with us here in a minute, which is, Lord, break my heart for what breaks yours. Lord, help me smile on the things that make you smile. Help me to see others as you see them. And that can make all the difference in the world. If you've never said uh, yes to Jesus, and that, that could be something that you could do today, I want to just encourage you to take a next step of faith. You've been hearing about empathy, and you've been hearing about Jesus, and loving one another, and, and feeling needs. If there's something here that's stirring your heart, and you want to say yes to Jesus, you can do that. If you need prayer, please reach out. We'd love to pray with you too, and that could be online as well. But let's, uh, let's pause for a word of prayer. And, uh, and ask God to move. Father, we thank you for uh, your love, your faithfulness, the, the things that you model for us in your son Jesus on empathy and feeling what someone feels and, 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 and having a heart to know where people are at uh, because you're curious. Father, help us to, 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 to have our hearts break for those things that break your heart. Have, help us to smile on those things that, that, that make you smile. Father, help us to see people as you see them and help us all to have a bigger heart to care unconditionally for those around us. Father, help us to be people of empathy and help us to be operating as your hands and feet in the world, your hands that extend love. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. On the night before Jesus went to the cross as a sacrifice for sin, he was having a meal a Passover meal with his disciples. And sometime during the conversation, he said to them, there is no greater love than this, than one who lays down his life for his friends. If you do what I command you, you are my friends. I no longer call you servants, but friends. During that meal, as they were eating it, he said, do this in remembrance of me, and then continue doing it as you meet, until I return. And he took some bread, and he said, this is my body that is given for you. Take this in remembrance of me. And then he took the cup, and he said, this is my blood poured out for the forgiveness of sin. Drink this in remembrance of me. This is a new covenant between you and me. As we come up together to take the elements of communion, we remember Jesus, and we celebrate that one day he will return but it is also a very deeply personal time between you and God. Take some time to pray, examine your heart, and reflect and respond on what Jesus did for you. There is no greater love than this, than one that lays down his life for his friends. What a friend we have in Jesus. All our sins and griefs to bear. What a privilege that we can carry everything to him in prayer. Let's pray. Father, we are just so thankful that you love us, that you care about us, that you listen to us, that you have grace and mercy with us. Lord, we just ask if there's anyone here that doesn't know you or needs to step back into relationship with you, that you would open their heart and that they know that you would just wrap your arms around them. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. If you're a member of Dallas Church or you feel led to give today, you can do so by putting a gift in one of the giving boxes, going to dallaschurch.org, the Church Center app, or mailing a check to the P.O. box. Let's take communion together and continue in our worship. Word. 
worthy of every song we could ever sing. Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring. Worthy of every breath we could ever bring. We live for you. Jesus, the name above every other name. Jesus, the only one who could ever save. Worthy of every breath we could ever bring. We do it for you.
We thank you, Lord, that we can put our trust in you. God, that we can build our house upon that solid rock. That you are with us through every storm. You never leave us alone. God, we thank you so much. Thanks for being with us today. A reminder that if you're new, make sure you stop by the connection booth. We have a gift that we'd like to give you. And then if you're new online, drop into that chat feature and just let your host know so that they can reach out to you. I also want to give a quick reminder that if you ever find yourself unable to make it to Sunday service, this summer we are offering that Saturday evening service. And that's an opportunity to, again, interact with a host. So make sure you check that out if you ever miss a Sunday morning. And with that, let's have a great week and go be the church to our community.